want to take this time and welcome you to another episode of Just Teach. If this is your first time visiting us, I want to extend a very heartfelt welcome to you. If you have any comments, questions, any prayer requests, the comments section is for you. And for everyone watching, we ask as always that you like and that you share the video. And if you haven't already, certainly take the time to subscribe to the channel. All of these things go such a long way in helping us spread the message of the gospel all around the world. Do want to let you know, as always, that we do provide notes to go along with the lesson. We've got notes and the PowerPoint slide deck. They are linked in the show notes. If you go in the description of this video, there are two hyperlinks. You can click and download those. They are both absolutely free. They are our gift to you. We just hope that they are an edification and encouragement to you as you continue to study the word of God. So we are rounding out. This is our last lesson in the fall quarter of the Union Gospel Press. This has been an amazing, amazing quarter. We have been studying uh, the concept of success and failure. If you haven't already, uh, certainly take the time. Go pick up your next quarter. The winter quarter book looks something like this. So if you have an opportunity to pick it up, certainly pick that up. Uh, and we will begin that one on next week. But we are in this very last lesson of the quarter of the union of the unit, and it's entitled Judgment and Exile. We are coming out of Second Chronicles, chapter number 36, verses 15 through 21. And then we will continue in the book of Psalms, the 137th Psalm, verses one through six. Amazing, amazing time. We're going to jump right into it. I do want to also wish everyone a very happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> if you haven't already uh, celebrated, certainly happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, I'm actually recording this on Thursday on Thanksgiving Day. So uh, hopefully you had an opportunity to spend some time with your loved ones and to express thanks and to make some magical memories. So here we are. Let's jump right into today's lesson. As we always do, I'm going to do just like I did on last week. I'm going to jump right into the lesson context so that we can begin to get some background on what's going on in today's passage. So the first point I have highlighted here, it says the northern kingdom was taken into Assyrian captivity in 722 BC under the reign of Hosea. Now, the passage of scripture that we are reading with 2 Chronicles 36 actually deals with Judah, the southern kingdom. But I thought it was certainly worthy of note to mention that at this point, the northern, the northern kingdom was already captured. You know, we had talked about this very briefly on last week when we were in the book of Amos, Amos chapter number five, it ended in verse 27 and it said, therefore will I cause you to go into what? Captivity beyond Damascus. We talked about on last week on how Damascus was a northern city that was north of the of the northern uh, tribes, if you will, of the northern uh, half of the northern kingdom, and that this city Damascus is where the Assyrians were. So there was going to be a captivity that would come from the Assyrians, as prophesied by Amos. And at this point, we were at Second Chronicles thirty six. That captivity has actually taken place. If you read 2 Kings chapter number 18, verse 11, it says, and the king of Assyria did carry away Israel into Assyria. Understand the northern kingdom called Israel, southern kingdom referred to as Judah. So in this particular passage in 2 Kings 18, it was actually talking about the northern kingdom. I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, certainly download the uh, the notes because I've got some parallel texts along with the Second Chronicles that that illustrate some good reading to help give you a nice full background on what's going on. Because these events that we're going to be reading about in Second Chronicles thirty six are recorded in Second Kings. 24, 25. They're also recorded in Jeremiah, a few places, Jeremiah chapter 39, also Jeremiah chapter 52. So definitely read, help you get some good background. But again, yes, at this point, the Assyrians have already conquered the northern kingdom. And now we are making our way to where the Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans, we're going to be using those interchangeably in today's lesson. They are going to conquer the southern kingdom, which is Judah. So second point we have here, Zedekiah was the 20th and final king of the southern kingdom. He was the youngest of Josiah's sons to rule. His rule began at the age of 21, and he ruled for 11 years. So a lot of interesting stuff that's being mentioned here, because what we saw is that, again, the southern kingdom had 20 
20 kings, the northern kingdom did not. And the last three kings of the southern kingdom were sons of Josiah. Now, it's it's interesting to observe because at this point where he begins to rule, he's actually ruling while the, the, the Chaldeans are, are trying to control the southern kingdom. And he wasn't really uh, an official king uh, in the sense that he had you know complete autonomy and authority uh, he was more or less he was going to be a puppet king and and these campaigns that the chaldeans these several campaigns that they were launching against the southern kingdom it, it, they really didn't want to control the southern kingdom what they wanted is that they wanted them to just simply pay tribute to them but they did in fact want them to just rule themselves control their own land manage their own property but they wanted to reap the benefit of it but what you're going to find is that so oftentimes when they would place a king who they thought that they can control, that king would rebel against them and that uh, the Chaldeans would have to go in and start fighting and raging war in order to get out of them what they wanted. But if you read First Chronicles 3 and 15, it says, in the sons of Josiah were firstborn Johanan, second was Jehoiakim, and then third Zedekiah, and it even mentions his fourth son. But uh, the 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 rulership uh, didn't make it to the four sons. Zedekiah was the was the last king of Judah, and at the the last campaign that uh, the king Nebuchadnezzar raised against the southern uh, uh, southern kingdom ended in 586 at the end of Zedekiah's rule, and that was the end of the southern kingdom. Also, wanted to make note that during the rule of Zedekiah, Zedekiah was a spiritually depraved leader. What do I mean? I mean, he was somebody who engaged in idolatry. He was somebody that, that, that did not fully walk in the principles of God's word, did not follow the oracles that were given from the prophets. And so oftentimes in biblical history, when you had a king that did not regard the will of God, you had a people that did not regard the will of God. So by him being a king and not walking in God's principles, he led the people astray. If you read in 2 Chronicles 36 and 12, which is just prior to our lesson, it says he did that which was evil. Get this, in the sight of the Lord, but also this, it says, and humble not himself before Jeremiah, the prophet, uh, speaking from the mouth of the Lord. What, what does that mean when it does say he did not humble himself before Jeremiah, the prophet? God had sent Jeremiah on a few occasions to prophesy to Zedekiah and let him know that this captivity that's taking place by the Chaldeans, it is God allowed. And he's saying because it is God allowed, simply let it happen. Don't fight. Don't resist it because this is a part of my plan for Judah. But because he was an evil man and did not want to regard the will of God, he kept rebelling against the Chaldeans and he kept trying to fight just like he was fighting against the instructions of Jeremiah. But it didn't just stop here. If you read in verse 14, it says, moreover, it says all the chief of the priests and the people get this transgress very much after all the abominations of the heathen. So it wasn't just that he was trying to fight for his freedom, but he was in fact engaging in idolatry and resisting the will of God. All of these things led to the ultimate downfall of this Southern kingdom. Now you can read Jeremiah's warning to Zedekiah in Jeremiah chapter 34, verses one through 10. Uh, it's kind of kind of a, uh, an interesting passage of scripture to kind of read how Jeremiah is really speaking to the fulfillment of various prophecies from people like Amos, people like Habakkuk, people like Isaiah. There, there were several prophets that had prophesied decades past, centuries past, and now this is the fulfillment of it. And he is more or less saying, let God's will happen. But he didn't want to do that. Finally, I have pointed out here, it says Zedekiah rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, thinking the Egyptian Pharaoh and his army would continue to support him. Also, this is a, this is something that's, uh, uh, that's illustrated in Jeremiah chapter 37. You know, uh, Zedekiah was being pushed <laughs> by the by the nobles by by the by the Jewish elites they were saying listen we are under this this Chaldean occupation we need to rebel against them we we need to get out from under their finger and at one point the Egyptian pharaoh had sent military aid to help them in this endeavor uh, i've got it listed here in in Jeremiah 37 and 7 it says thus saith the lord god of israel thus shalt thou say to the king of judah that, that uh sent you unto 
to me to inquire. He's talking to Jeremiah. Uh, at one point, Zedekiah had inquired of Jeremiah. It's, it's crazy. You, you'll, you'll ask the prophet, what is God saying? But if God doesn't say something that you want to hear, then you'll rebel. But he says, behold, Pharaoh's army, which is come forth to help you, shall return to Egypt unto their own land. So they're acknowledging the fact that you've got help right now, but it's not going to remain. It says, and the Chaldeans shall come again and fight against this city and take it and burn it with fire. So uh, uh, again, he, here it is. It's showing that the ultimate will of God for them is to enter in this captivity because this is something that God is trying to work out in their lives. You can read about that in Ezekiel chapter 17, verse 15 as well. So let's do this. That's the end. That's the context. That's the background. Let's jump into verse number 15 and let's begin to unpack. It says, and the Lord God of their fathers sent them uh, sent to them by his messenger, rising up betimes and sending because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Now look at what's going on here. This is this this passage is a high level overview of of events that took place over a span of time. We might be reading, you know, just about five or six verses here, and it seems like this is a quick span of time, but no, what, what is being rent, written right here, and most historians estimate that it is Ezra that wrote the book of Chronicles. What Ezra would be writing here is he would be writing about events that transpired over a span of time. And if you know anything about Ezra, Ezra lived during the time of the post-exilic uh, uh, time frame. So this would have been uh, after uh, the Jews would have been allowed to go back into the city of Jerusalem to begin to rebuild. So he's writing, uh, looking retrospect. He's not writing real time. These are stories that would have been passed down, you know, orally over time. And he's taking the time to record it and he's looking back. And that's why you're seeing, you know, decades and years of time being compressed in just a few verses. But what is being written here is it's saying that messengers were sent. Well, who were these messengers in this particular context? They were talking about prophets. We're talking about people who are carrying the message of God. And in other words, it's saying that God sent word through people like Isaiah, people like uh, Amos, people like Habakkuk, people like Jeremiah. He sent messengers, maybe some household names that we're not used to. And he's telling them about what God is trying to do in the midst of his people. And, and look at this. It says rising up betimes. If you read this in another translation, it might say that he sent them frequently. He sent them with urgency. It, it, God didn't just send in one message, but God sent multiple message and he sent it with haste. He sent it with the frequency so people can understand that this is something important. Why would God send repetitive messages to them? Because he had compassion. God wanted to spare them. In other words, God wanted to uh, give them an opportunity to avoid this uh, pending punishment, this pending uh, exile that's getting ready to take place. But we're going to read about how they wouldn't listen. But I just want to take the time to point out real quick before we make our way to verse number 16, how this is showing a very stark contrast between prophets of biblical time versus prophets of today. Prophets of today, they 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 they, they would present prophecies that are 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 you know, would tickle your ear. There, there are things that people want to hear. There are things that people want to receive. But this is showing how in biblical times, prophets would prophesy and they would carry the warnings of God. They would carry the message of God. You know, one thing I've often said on this channel is that prophets should be using their voices to point the people's hearts back to God. Oftentimes, the prophets were sent with a word, a very stern word, to turn people who were not operating in the will of God to turn them back to God, and they often faced opposition. They often faced rejection. You know, I've been talking about Habakkuk quite a bit, but in Habakkuk chapter one, verse number one, it, it opens up saying the burden which Habakkuk the prophet did see. If you read this in the Message Bible, it says the problem. You know, you, you know that you're really a prophet of God if you see what God has given you as a burden. If you see what God has given you as you addressing the problem, this isn't stuff that people always want to hear. 
hear, but it's what people need to hear because it is the word of God. So understand this, but prophets like Habakkuk, prophets like Jeremiah were, were constantly articulating and heralding the word of God, but they were constantly facing rejection. I want you to read this in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 10. This is what the people would want out of prophets. It says, which say to the seer, a seer is a prophet, is saying, see not. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us what right things. Tell us the wrong things. Tell, tell us things that 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 are easy to us. Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceits. In other words, they're saying lie to us. This this is the prophecies that we're seeing in the modern mm -hmm. church, and that's the challenge because they would water down the office of the prophet. It would it would it would cause really so many modern Christians to think that the office of the prophet doesn't is not even relevant to the current church. Why? Because you're not seeing people operate according to what we saw in biblical times because in biblical times they faced so much opposition, but here it is we're seeing in verse number 15 it's saying that God has sent messenger after message after message after message trying to get the people People to understand that they are not walking in ways that please him. So what do we see? What, what is the response by the people? Verse number 16, it says, but they mocked. Who did they mock? They mocked the messengers of God and they despised his words. And it says, and they misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against the people. Get this. It says to there was no remedy. Now, understand this. Anytime you see list of three in Scripture, the third element is always the most profound element. Anytime you see list of three. So we're seeing mocked, despised, misused. Now, number one, when it says that they were mocking the prophets, you don't see many prophets getting mocked today because they're saying things that people want to hear. But mock means to joke. It means to, to make a jest out of them. They were making a joke out of the prophets, and they were making a joke out of what the prophets were saying. They, they didn't want to take it seriously. When it says that they despise them, get this, it, 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 it means in its connotation to raise the head loftily and disdainfully. It, in other words, you, you think that you're smarter than a prophet. You think that you're more important than the prophet. You think that you know more than the prophet. So here it is when it says that they're raising their head loftily. What they're hearing is, isn't something that they agree with. So they're despising. So here it is. They're mocking. They're making fun of the prophet. They think that they know more than the prophet and they're despising his sayings. And then finally, it says it says that they are misusing what the prophet is saying. They're saying that they're mocking him, scoffing. It means to stammer. Look at this, to slip with the tongue in speaking. You know, in other words, they began to present themselves as opposition to the problem. When you scoff someone, you are you are making fun of them. You are talking down to them. You're trying to kill their influence. You're trying to kill their reputation. You know, one, one common strategy in a, in a courtroom is that you try to discredit the witness. Why? Because when somebody's standing up and telling the truth and you can't refute the truth, you try to attack their character. You attack their character so that what they're saying, so so that what they say, people won't believe it because they'll see them as an uncredible source. And that's what people are doing when they're trying to scoff these prophets. They're trying to attack their character so that when they stand up and tell the truth, it, they're, they're trying to lessen the impact of it. So it's, it's, it's such a tragic situation because God is sending these prophets for their benefit and they are standing in direct opposition. They are mocking, they are despising, they are misusing. So it got to the point where God's wrath had boiled up now to the point where it says that there was no remedy. Now I got to pause here. Got to pause here because you're seeing you're seeing something very challenging right here. You're seeing a point to where God's wrath got to a place where he it uh, it would almost seem as though His grace had ran out, His mercy had ran out, and now God is saying. I've got to respond to this. Now, this this no remedy. Do, do I have a slide for this? If I don't have a slide for it, I can tell you right now. A remedy is a healing. It is a cure. It is health. So it's saying that that they God's wrath had gotten to a point to where there was no cure. There, there was there was nothing that that could be done. And I and I and I pose this question. I pose this question 
does God's mercy have limitations? Because we read places in scripture where it says that his mercies are renewed every morning. And, and, and God certainly is a merciful God. Scripture says that we can come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and get the grace that we need to help in the time of need. So we preach that God is a merciful God. But we ask the question, is there a limitation to God's mercy? I want to pose this to you. In Romans chapter 9, verse 15, it says, For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. What is this talking about? This is saying that God is a merciful God, but God is also sovereign. What does that mean? It means that God is the one that will dictate where and how his mercy is applied. We, it, is, it is not on us as believers. It is not the will of him that runneth to try to say when God is going to show mercy. So it is our responsibility to simply heed the warnings of God and to not try to take advantage of the mercy of God. Why? Because we don't know where and how God's going to apply his mercy. Now, I, I have to I have to point this out because, you know, sometimes we, we, we don't want to present God as a God that that you do not have the opportunity to come to when you want to get things right with him. By all means, you can come boldly before the throne of grace. But but how do you know that you've gone from a place to where you have uh, uh, caused God's wrath to boil up to where there's no remedy? Well, the interesting answer to that is that it's not so much about God, but it's about you. The question is, is can you still be convicted? The question is, is can your heart be pricked? Do you see wrong as wrong? You know, sometimes God can send the preach word so frequently to where it just becomes commonplace. Sometimes God can send his preach word to where it kind of goes in one ear and out the other, and we take it for granted. So then when we are convicted, we ignore the convictions and push past convictions and keep doing whatever we want to do to the point that we become callous to the word of God. And that's when you start to question, well, how far can God's mercy go to reach you? Because if God is, he said, the day you hear my voice, harden not your heart. But if you harden your heart and you push past the messengers of God, well, how can you be convicted? And how can you be brought to a place of faith? But when you get to a place where you can't be convicted or brought to a place of faith, then you start to wonder, is there a remedy for your situation? Let's keep going. Verse number 17, it says, therefore, he brought unto them the king of the Chaldees. This is, this, is, this is talking about King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Babylonians. It says, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary. It says, and had no compassion upon the young man or maiden or old in him that stooped for age. Get this. That means to uh, stoop for age means that they were up in age uh, to a point of they were kind of decrepit. Uh, and it says, and he, he says, he gave them all unto his hand. Now, this is again, this this is talking uh, really over a, a span of time. This is not just even though this is one verse, but it's talking about how King Nebuchadnezzar over a period of time uh, presented himself as opposition against the southern kingdom, against the people of Judah. And he slew them with the sword, destroyed the sanctuary, had no compassion upon him, young and old, you know, uh, uh, men and women, uh, you know, children, everybody involved were, were subject to this attack. I, I want you to see what's going on here. Now, this again was prophesied in the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk had prophesied this literally, you know, uh, uh, centuries before. And when we think of Habakkuk, so oftentimes we think of Habakkuk chapter two, where it talks about writing the vision and making it plain so that he that runneth may continue to run. And, and we, we, we get so excited about Habakkuk chapter number two, but if you understand the context of it, the prophet is prophesying and he's warning of what? The Chaldeans. And he's saying, you're going to go through this captivity. And, and over the course of this captivity, you're going to want to lose faith. You're going to want to lose hope. But what he's telling them is to write the vision and let them know that this captivity is not going to be always. God is going to bring you out after a period of time, but it's going to test you. It's going to challenge your faith. 
And, and it's interesting to observe that because we're, we're going to make our way uh, in a moment to the 137th Psalm where the psalmist is writing really out of mourning during this Babylonian captivity. But in their mourning, they're still acknowledging God as God. And I think that that's something that's that's interesting to observe is that during the Babylonian captivity, people held on to their faith. People held on to God. And, and, and that's what Habakkuk was trying to encourage them to let them know in this challenging time, hold on to God. So in Habakkuk 1 and 6, it says, for lo, I raise up what? Chaldeans. This is the Babylonians. It says, the bitter and hasty nation, which shall march through the breadth of the land to possess the dwelling places that are not theirs. I encourage you, read, read those beginning verses of Habakkuk chapter number one, because it just talks about how impressive the military is of the Chaldeans. And it talked about how violent they were as a people and how ferocious they were as a people and how God was going to use this, these pagan, you know, just violent people to chastise the people of God. And he, and he really even brought Habakkuk to a place of question, like, why would God use such a people? But understand this, this is God doing what? He's warning them. He's warning them. And that's that's what we even talked about. Uh, that's the name of this unit, really. This unit is lesson and warnings. When God is sending warnings, you've got to heed to the warnings of God. I think I've got a slide here. I do. So I wanted to point out the timeline of where we're at right now in, in uh, 2 Chronicles 36. We uh, are, are right now, right around 586, 587 uh, BC. But understand this, this is the third and final campaign against Judah that we're reading about. The first campaign was in 605 BC. And that's when you saw people like Daniel and the three Hebrew boys that were brought into captivity. And some of the stories that you read about in the beginning parts of Daniel, how they were made eunuchs and how they, they asked the, the prince of the eunuchs to, to allow them to, to eat according to their, their Judeo customs. And, and when they were found to be more fair uh, over that time, that it resulted in all of the eunuchs following their same diet, but they would have been taken into captivity. Uh, and, you know, you, you read about places like what we're reading about in this in this text, how the princes were taken in as well. Though that's an example, people like Daniel and three Hebrew boys. But then in the second wave in 597 BC, that's when people like the prophet Ezekiel, and the other prophet Ezekiel was in training to become a priest. Uh, but, but before he got an opportunity, to, to, uh, to uh, uh, step into his position in the temple, he was taken into captivity. And much of the prophecies that, that you read about in the book of Ezekiel, again, is God illustrating why the people of God are being held in captivity and what they need to do as far as their faith goes and holding on to their faith, knowing that God was going to restore them over a period of time. But what's interesting to observe is that 597 BC was not only the second attack, but it was also the year that Zedekiah was installed as king. Hmm. Interesting, because he served for 11 years. So he was installed as king in 597, but after he tried to you know, rebel and usurp authority over Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar came in for a third wave. And that's what we're really what we're reading about, where he finally took Zedekiah captive. You know, if you read the, the backstory, the back verses to all this, uh, you know, he killed his sons in front of him, plucked out his eyes and brought him into into captivity. Uh, but when you jump forward, really. Uh, a, a few decades later, under King Cyrus, you know, the the uh, the Persians uh, conquered the Babylonians and, and the king of the Persians was King Cyrus at the time. King Cyrus was much more amicable uh, towards the cho children of Israel and allowed them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild their temple. Now, he didn't set them free, per se, but he did allow them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild. And that's what you read about in 538 B.C. But for right now, we are in 586 B.C. under this third wave. Uh, this is the text in Second Kings illustrating what we're reading in Second Chronicles 39. It says, and it came to pass in the ninth year of his reign. So again, Zedekiah reigned for 11 years in his ninth year is when this third and final campaign took place. Started, it will started. It says in the 10th month, in the 10th day of the month, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his host against Jerusalem and pitched against it. It says, and they built forts against it. Look at this roundabout. That's critical right there to observe. 
round about. It says, and the city was besieged until the 11th year. Because somebody might wonder if, if they started fighting in the ninth year, why did it take two years, if you were, or a year and a half? It was, why did it last until the 11th year? Were they just fighting every day? No. What, what the military strategy at this time was they were trying to cut off resources. I want you to see that they were trying to cut off resources like things like wh whatever they might need to live, you know, water, grain, you know, medical supplies. If if he would encamp round about them, then they would cut them off to the world. And all they would have is what they had uh, stored uh, at, at the time of, of about the at the time of them being besieged. So those storage would last for a period of time but once those ran out the city would have to give up so that's what they were trying to do it was it was a very you know a strategic uh attack if you will but i don't have it listed here in in the in the uh in the slide deck but in jeremiah 52 and 67 it says uh yeah it says in the it says and in the fourth month in the ninth day of the month it says the famine was sore in the city so that there was no bread for the people, for the land, it says, then the city was broken up and all the men of war fled and went forth out of the city by night uh, of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden. So in other words, the military ran. Everybody ran because they, they, they had nothing to eat. Their their resources were dried up and because they were in camp roundabout, they couldn't get in, they, they couldn't get anything in. So that was the strategy. And that's why it, it ended up uh, culminating in 586 BC. Didn't stop there though. Verse number 18, it says, in all the vessels of the house, great of uh, the house of God, excuse me, the temple, great and small, in the treasures of the house of the Lord, in the treasures of the king and of the princes, in all these he brought to Babylon. So get look at that in verse number 18, in of the princes. That's that's an example again in 605 BC when he brought Daniel and three Hebrew boys. There was other princes, likely nobility, people of great wealth, people of you know, political importance. He brought all of these people into Babylon. I want you to get this. It says, and they burnt the house of God and break down the wall of Jerusalem and burnt all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels. Now, I want you to see what happened here, because this was not the, you know, the temple being destroyed because they were in battle. This wasn't the walls being destroyed because they were in battle. This, this, these, these weren't the, the houses of the nobility and all that stuff being destroyed because they were in battle. They had conquered them at this point, but what they were doing is they were showing, first of all, this was a show of force, and this was to try to kill their spirit. They were trying to trying to kill their spirit of rebellion. They were trying to kill their spirit of them. Look, look at I want, I want you to understand. Like I told you before, it wasn't their initial intent to really control this area. They wanted this area to be self-sustained and just pay them tribute. But because they kept rebelling, because their spirit kept rising up, they're like, okay, let's encamp round about them. Let's starve them out. And then let's destroy their temple. Let's destroy everything that gives them hope. And if you read this, honestly, if you read this in like the Jeremiah text, it talks about how they just left the, 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 those that are impoverished. They left those who were impoverished there, didn't take them to captivity because essentially they just wanted somebody left again to work the land. He said, hopefully these poor people can figure out how to work the land and try to make some type of crop and some type of pro produce out of them. But all of those who are noble, all of those who are princes, all of those who are who have treasure and stuff like that, we're taking it all. We're taking it all to Babylon. Now, understand this. I want you to understand this. The Babylonian headquarters was in historical Mesopotamia between the Tigris and Euphrates. Now, in verse number 18, it says they took the treasures of the king and also took the treasures of the house of the Lord. I want you to see this. They took these things and they stored them, but get this, they never spent it. They never used it. Because when you read about in Ezra, in Ezra chapter five, under King Persia, when, when, when King Cyrus uh, released Israel to go back into Jerusalem to start rebuilding the temple, he gives them these treasures back. In Ezra 5 and 14, it says, In the vessels also of gold and silver of the house of God, which Nebuchadnezzar took out of the temple that was in Jerusalem. That's what we're reading about, 2 Chronicles 36. 
It says, and brought them into the temple of Babylon. Those did Cyrus the king take out of the temple of Babylon, and they were delivered unto me, whose name was uh, Sheshbazar. It says, whom he made governor. Governor what? Over, over Israel or over Judah. So these things were returned to them, which is kind of it's kind of interesting to observe that again, that they were not. This was just a show of power. This this was just to break their spirit. So they brought all of these things uh, into uh, in into their their uh, their Babylonian temple, and they held them for safekeeping. Now I've got listed here, and I don't have a, uh, it listed in the slide deck. But in, in 2 Kings 25, 8 and 9, it talks about the destruction of the temple, but it says something interesting. It says, and in the fifth month, in the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, it says, came uh, Nebuchadnezzar, it says, captain of the guard, servant of the king of Babylon, it says, unto Jerusalem, it says, and he burnt the house of the Lord in the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem and every great man's house burnt with fire so it was in the fifth month of them taking israel captive or them taking zedekiah king zedekiah into captivity i want you to see that so it wasn't even like they just immediately burned the city down it wasn't like they immediately destroyed the temple like i told you them destroying the temple and destroying the walls it wasn't because of war they went back five months later and did that they went back five months later to try to kill the spirit of the people because at that time it's saying that Nebuchadnezzar was their king. And this is what he wanted to do to try to ensure that they did not usurp authority against him. Very interesting stuff to observe. We're building something here. We're building something here because we got, oh, I've got it listed here. Uh, we, we, we're building something here because we got to get to the 137th Psalm. So then finally in verse number 20, it says, In them that had escaped from the sword carried heat away into Babylon. Again, not everybody was killed. That wasn't even their intent. But those who were important, the princes, great men, they were carried into, ba into Babylon and the poor people were left behind. It says, where they were servants to him in the sons until the reign of the king of Persia, kingdom of Persia. So this again, kingdom of Persia, we're talking about King Cyrus. The Persian kingdom conquers the Babylonian kingdom. It says in verse number 20, it says to fulfill the word of the Lord, which is by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land, get this, had enjoyed her Sabbath for as long as she lay desolate, she kept the Sabbath to fulfill, get this, three score in 10 years so again this is the 70 years of captivity that is prophesied or that was prophesied by jeremiah in jeremiah chapter 25 verse 11 it says in this whole land shall be desolation and an astonishment and these nations shall serve the king of babylon 70 years now understand this the the these 70 years of of captivity was in direct proportion to how many years they had not honored the land Sabbath. So there's a lot going on here. They were, they were carried in captivity because of their rebellion to the prophets. They were carried into captivity because of their idolatry. And the length of time that they spent in captivity was in direct proportion to them not honoring the land Sabbath. If you read in Leviticus chapter 25, verses one through seven, uh, under the Mosaic law, God had instructed every seven years for there to be no harvest, no, no farming, no crop. In, in, their, in the sixth year, they were to reap enough harvest to last them that seventh year, to last them essentially two years. And as a measure of faith, as an act of faith for them to show that they are dependent on God and not on the land, they would do what was called a land Sabbath. Well, if you measure if you do the if you do the math and if it's and if you multiply 70 times 7 you've got 490 so this is what what this is essentially saying is that for for the better part of 5 centuries they had not honored the land sabbath and most historians calculate this is going back all the way to king saul is saying that they did not honor the land sabbath and because they did not honor it now god is put god is using that as a time frame to measure their captivity they did not honor the land sabbath very challenging stuff to 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 observe here. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing here at the end of this verse, 
where he makes reference to, or in verse number 20, the kingdom of Persia. We've been talking about it all this time. As a matter of fact, Isaiah, Isaiah had prophesied uh, uh, really centuries before that it was going to be the King Cyrus that was going to present himself as some type of redeemer for the people of Israel. In Isaiah 44 and 28, it says, that saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. So if you go on and you read in the book of Ezra, book of Ezra essentially opens up with King Cyrus giving a decree and saying the children of Israel can go back to Jerusalem and begin to rebuild. That was in 538 BC that the Persians as a people, as, as, as a, you know, even though they were under captivity, they had a lot of respect for people's religious practices. So they didn't, they weren't as heavy handed, if you will, as the Babylonians. They, they, they wanted to give them the opportunity to, to worship God. As a matter of fact, if really, if you read on in the book of Ezra, uh, the king, of, king Cyrus, in so many ways, was showing evidence of faith. Some of the things that he did, some of the ways that he supported them building the temple and, and sowed into the uh, the Jewish effort that was going on there, it was, it was almost to show that he believed in their God. So it, it's very powerful stuff to, 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 to read, but it's very interesting to read that Isaiah had prophesied it centuries before, and now you're reading about it in 2 Chronicles and in Jeremiah of it coming to pass. So at this point, where we're cutting off in biblical history is Judah is in captivity. They are at the beginning, 586 BC, they are at the beginning of their captivity, and then we make our way into this 137th Psalm. Now we're gonna hit this really quickly. This 137th Psalm, whose author is unknown, is written by somebody who is in captivity. They are expressing their sorrow. They are expressing their emotional hurt. They are expressing their disdain and disappointment for, for being under Babylonian captivity. And it's saying, verse number one, it says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. The, the rivers of Babylon, what, what you had is you had these man-made canals that ran from the Euphrates to the Tigris. The Euphrates was at a higher elevation. It would run down to the Tigris. And, and Babylonians, for all intent and purposes, were a very technologically advanced people. They had a great military. They they had great architecture, you know, uh, in their buildings. And it's it's almost poetic. It's it's really tragic to to think that yes, they're in captivity, but they were in a land that was probably better than the land that they came from. But they did not want to be there. They did not desire it. Number one, because they were being held there as as captives. But then number two, it's saying that they remembered Zion. Now that they were longing for the things of God, isn't that interesting? <laughs> now that they are reaping the punishment of their disobedience and their rebellion, now they're saying, "Oh, but we remember how wonderful the presence of God were. We remember how wonderful the things of God were. So the thing of the things of God were. So Zion is literally a, a name for the city of Jerusalem. Its name means parched place." But it it is a uh, it is a reference to Jerusalem. So whenever you read that in Scripture, you know you're talking about Jerusalem and and that specific place where the temple was, where central worship took place. It says we hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. Uh, in other words, the harp, the, the the string instrument, they wouldn't let it touch the ground. But when it's not in use, it's saying that they're hanging them on the willows there. In other words, they're saying that we're not using them. Why they're not using them? Well, because they're they're weeping and they're remembering Zion, and they don't they 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 don't feel like being joyous. They don't feel like giving praise. It says, "For there they carried us away captive, required of us a song, and they wasted." And it says, "And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, sing us uh, one of the songs of Zion.'" So, in other words. Their captives are asking them to entertain them. Their captives are asking them to, and this, this is not out of respect. 
you know, this this is uh, and, and it could be as far as mocking them. But either way it goes, they're saying, here, give, give us a piece of your culture. Sing us one of your songs. And they're saying, no, we're, we don't we don't want to sing one of your songs. Why? Because you have wasted us. This word wasted. It means to vexed. It means to torment. Uh, it is the act of him who causes others to lament. In other words, when they say that they're wasted, we, 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 and we talk about the book of Lamentations, which was written by Jeremiah. And Jeremiah would have been around the time of them being taken into Babylonian captivity. So here it is. They, they are lamenting. They are weeping. They, they remember Zion. So he's saying we are weeping and you're asking us to sing songs of joy. Well, we're not in an emotional place to sing songs of joy. We are in an emotional place where we are hurting. So finally, in these last three verses, it says, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? That, that strange, mean, it means foreign. It, it means this is not our homeland. This is not where we're supposed to be. It says, if I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. That's, that's her skill. In other words, it's saying I play the harp with, with my right hand and it's saying that if I forget Zion and if, if I sit up here and try to enjoy myself in Babylon, he says, let my let my right hand forget how to play the harp. It says, if I do not remember thee, get this, let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth. In other words, if your tongue is clean to the roof of your mouth, you can't sing, you can't express odes of joy, which is what they're asking to, what they're asking them to do. And it says, if I prefer not Jerusalem above my chief joy. So they're coming full circle. That's that's what we're seeing right here. We're, we're seeing that these were a people who had rebelled against God, engaged in idolatry, and get this most of all, they had rejected the messengers, they had rejected the prophets, and they mocked them, and they scorned them, and they despised them. But now that they have experienced this punishment, look at this, Proverbs chapter 13, verse 15, it says, good understanding gives favor. And what is implied there is that if you understand, if you know better, you do better, but the way of a transgressor is hard. So this, this is showing that, look, there, there are consequences to our action. There are natural and spiritual consequences to our action. And sometimes God has to allow these consequences. He has to allow there to be no remedy for a season. He has to allow you to come to a place where you are reaping what you have sown in order for you to come to a place where you prefer Jerusalem and that Jerusalem is your chief joy again. He's got to bring you to a place where you, where you honor God. Now, listen, this, this, this is not to end on a sour note. Scripture talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that these things were given to us as our example. That that's that's what this unit is. They, they are warnings. They are examples and they are warnings for us as believers. We have hope. We should look to what's going on in, with, with the people of Judah right here and say, listen, when God sends his word, I'm going to honor God's word. I'm going to listen to what God is saying. I'm not going to test God's mercy. I'm not going to test the limits of his wrath or anything like that. I'm going to obey God and I'm going to obey him quickly. Listen, that is our lesson for today. I certainly hope, I pray something was said to encourage you along the way. I want to remind you as always, listen, there's a prayer line in the description of this video. If you came to the conclusion over the course of this video that maybe you wanted to give your life to the Lord and you wanted somebody to walk you through that prayer of faith, that prayer line is available for you. And maybe you've got something that you're believing God for. Maybe you want somebody to touch and agree and bombard heaven with you. Listen, that prayer line is for you as well. And for everybody else, as always, listen, we love you with the love of the Lord. We'll see you next time. Perhaps you'd like to be a financial support to Just Teach Ministries. There are two ways that you can give through Cash App at dollar sign C O D W C or through Super Thanks, which is located in the ribbon of buttons just below this video. And remember, any amount you give is greatly appreciated. Come on, come on.